Hello, welcome to part four of this video series thing that I'm doing about genetic algorithms. Okay, what's gonna happen now? In this particular video, what I wanna do is actually finally, I know it's taking me four videos, look at the code itself. So I have a pre-made code example, as you know. I'm not gonna write it from scratch. It's coming from the nature of code, chapter nine. You can find the link to the chapter and the code in this video's description. But what I'm gonna do is look at the algorithm itself that I covered in detail a couple videos ago and look at where all of those pieces are. So what does it mean to initialize a population randomly? What does it mean to do step two, selection, to calculate the fitness of every member of that population? How do you write a function in code to actually do that? How do you write a function to a, to pick randomly, but have each thing that you're picking randomly have some sort of higher or lower probability of being picked. That's a kind of a tricky problem. We'll look at how is that solved? And then how do you do this thing heredity? How do you do crossover? How do you write the algorithm for crossover? How do you write the algorithm for mutation? And then have this new population that you then make the current population repeat over and over again. So I wanna look at every single one of these steps and find in the code where those steps happen. So let's just start doing that. Uh, okay, actually before I do that though, let me at least, um, open up this directory here and show you that how I have the code organized. So I have the code organized, you know, there's the libraries folder for the P5JS uh, JavaScript library I'm using. There's the HTML file, which references the JavaScript files. And there's some like kind of worthless <laughs> styling and style.css. But the files that actually matter to you are sketch.js. That's where kind of the main program is. Set up this initialization state is. Draw, this looping state is. That uh, uh, population.js, that's an object that manages the array of all the elements of the population. So there's functions for calculating the fitness values there. There's functions for doing the selection there. And then there's the dna.js file. This is a really important file because this file is actually this object, this DNA object, as I look at more sophisticated examples in future videos, the code in DNA.js will actually be present in almost all of them. So a lot of what's great, even though this example is kind of completely trivial example, because again, I could just type to be or not to be, that is the question. The code in this example can actually be almost lifted essentially verbatim to other scenarios to write your own genetic algorithm. And that's kind of the next video after this one that I'll get to, how do you take this code and implement it in a different scenario yourself. But so the DNA.js has that DNA object. It has a, a function for mutation. It stores the characters for each phrase, that sort of thing. It's each individual element of the population. Okay, so let's go back to the algorithm. Step one, create a population of n elements. So let's go to the code. And where this happens is actually in population.js. And we can actually see this happen right here. Uh, I say create population equals a new population. So the population is made with three arguments. A target, which is the target phrase, to be or not to be, which I could change. A mutation rate and a population max. So those values are sort of stored also in that population object. And in the population object itself, this is the kind of key variable. This dot population. Oh, no. <laughs> don't forget, don't forget this dot. So uh, 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 variables that are part of that object itself are attached to it by saying this dot population. So this is a constructor function that's creating a JavaScript object and a population is made as an empty array. And then there are a certain number of elements of the population made as DNA objects. So the so what the um, I think if I uh, come over here for a second, the population object itself <laughs> is just a big array of n elements, and each one of those elements is a random phrase. You know, popcorn. You know, uh, unijorm. Whatever these sort of weird. Nonsense, you know, A, 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 whatever. The, each one of the members of the population is a random phrase. And, but it's not just a string. So rather than use just a kind of literal string, uh, what I'm actually doing is creating a DNA object. And this is kind of crucial. And this is now where the DNA.js file comes in. DNA.js has an object itself, which is an array, called this.genes. So if I come back over here, Whoops. <laughs> Step on a light on a fan. Uh, I think I broke. No, I didn't break this. Anyway, that light went off. This might be a little bit darker for a second. <laughs> my back. Hello, everything's okay. The fan is blowing out my legs. So this is the population array. Each element of the array is a phrase, which is actually a DNA object, which itself is an array. 
and each element of that array being a single character. Okay, so that's how each element of the, the population is an array of elements, each element is an array of characters. So this is ultimately how the, uh, whoops, let me come over here. This is ultimately how that population is made. Make a certain number of DNA objects. Each DNA object, uh, each element is a new car. Now one thing that's a little bit goofy here is I wrote an entire function to uh, make a random character. There might be an easier way to do this in JavaScript, but I really just want random characters. I'm using that sort of ASCII table here. So I'm picking a random number between 63 and 122 and then converting those from that number to a string using its character code. So like using the ASCII table. And if you're not sure what the ASCII table is, I'll try to include a reference a link in this video's description to that. So that <laughs> is step one, initialize. Okay. Step two being selection. Now we need to evaluate the fitness of every element of the population. So where does that happen? So one thing, by the way, that I think is worth looking at but is, this, uh, is this main program, right? So draw, by the way, look at this. The draw function essentially, and it's funny how I'm doing this in a slightly weird order. I, I, maybe I should flip this around. But what the population does, uh, what the, the population object itself has all of these steps of the algorithm written in a specific functions. So I could just say population, calculate the fitness of every element. Population, perform natural selection. <laughs> population, generate the next population. And then population.evaluate, um, that, what that function does actually is just sort of checks to see if we're done. So these are the three, I kind of, I don't know why I did this. I'm going to just right now, put this first. Because it's looping over and over again, it doesn't necessarily matter. <laughs> but I'm going to calculate the fitness um, first, because this is sort of essentially the order of the, of the genetic algorithm itself. So this is, this is step uh, two right here, uh, selection, which calls that function calculate fitness, which is right here. Uh-oh, I froze. Hopefully I didn't actually object. Um, somebody in the chat will tell me if this stopped working. Uh, there's this function, calculate fitness. And notice what that function does. It loops through every single member of the population and calls another function, calc fitness. So when I say calc fitness on the population, really what I'm just doing is saying loop through the entire population and call a function on every element called calc fitness and check the fitness against that target phrase. So now if I go into the DNA object, we can see calc fitness right here. This is now a key key function in a gen any genetic algorithm is the fitness function itself. So you can see what's going on here. I start with a score of zero. I iterate over every single character in the phrase. If the particular character in the genes array matches the character in the target phrase, increase that score by one, and the fitness is the score divided by the total length. So the number of characters correct divided by the total length gives you a percentage. I got 9 out of 10 characters correct, a fitness score of 90%. So you can see that's what's happening. And so that's step two selection, calculate fitness. Initialize, generate 200 random DNA objects. Step two, calculate the fitness for those random DNA objects. Okay, now the next thing we need to do is reproduction. Now here's the thing. Let's come back over here and talk about how this is going to work. So let me erase this for a second. So if you recall, I had this idea of this spinning wheel, wheel of fortune. So here's the wheel. Maybe there are you know, a whole bunch of members of the population, uh, each with a certain fitness. And depending on their fitness, they get a bigger slice of that pie. And then the idea is you spin this wheel and you pick a parent and pick another parent. Well, you know, I could actually build in the code like this sort of physics simulation of a spinning wheel, but that would be a little bit overkill. There are a lot of different techniques of, um, of, of picking, uh, picking random elements from an array based on probabilities. There's a snake where, technique where I can pick two random numbers, a kind of qualifying random number. It's a, I forget what I called it. I actually just recently made a video or an example about this, uh, accept reject um, kind of algorithm. But the algorithm that I'm going to use is actually a very uh, simple technique that works well in this case. So let's say I have A, B, 
C and D. And I want A to have a 40%, A has a 40% uh, chance of being picked. B has a 20%. C uh, has a 15%. Oh, why did I make the math so hard on myself? 60, 75. No, 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 I don't, I don't. <laughs> this is not gonna turn out well for anybody with 15%. So we'll just make, um, we'll make C 10%. Uh, 40, 60, 70, and D, 30%, okay? Now, look at this. Let's say I have an array. This is the array, and the array looks like this. A, B, C, and D. Let's say I wanna pick a random element from that array. A, B, C, or D. Each element has an index, zero, one, two, or three. So I could pick a random number between zero and you know, four, but not including four. Each one of these has a 25% chance being pick, of picked. I have a one out of four chance, I can't write 25%, of picking any of those. What if, however, I were to write the array a different way? So I'm gonna write the array like this. A, 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 A. B, B. C. D, D, D. Notice I put A in that array four times, I put B in that array two times, C in that array one time, and D in that array three times. Now, there are 10 elements of the array, four of which are A. So if I pick a random value between zero and 10, not including 10, zero and nine, right? Four out of 10 times, I'm gonna pick zero, one, two, or three. An A. Two out of 10 times, I'm gonna pick a four or a five, a B. So what I can actually do, if I have a, po this is the population array. That's the actual population array in the code. I build another array, which I think I'm calling a mating pool. Or I might call it like Darwin or something. Where I take these elements and put them in this array a certain number of times according to their fitness. So the more times something is in an array, the more likely it is to be fit picked. And I think, if I come back over here for a second, um, I think I have, so this is kind of a, a, just some other diagrams demonstrating this idea, right? What if I have all of these elements with a different probability? This is the spinning the wheel approach. But what if instead I just create this big bucket and I put like A in there so many times, B in there so many times, C in there, and then I pick out of it. The more something is in the bucket, the likelihood, the likelihood, the, the higher the likelihood is that it will get picked. So how do you do this in code? If I go back to the code, again, we're looking now for this function, natural selection, which says generate a mating pool. So let's go look in population, and here it is. Notice what I do. This dot mating pool is now a new empty array. And, the, uh, and then ultimately later on, right down here, there is this code where I'm adding every member of the population into the mating pool n times. So how do I figure out what that number n should be? Well, the, you know, there's, I could, this could probably use some refinement and there's different ways you could do it. But ultimately up here, what I'm doing is finding out, okay, what's the number with, what's the, what's the member of the population with the most fitness, the highest fitness value? Then what I do is I take that object's that particular element's fitness and give it a number between zero and one mapped from zero to maximum fitness. So in other words, what I'm saying is I'm doing a sort of step where I'm normalizing all these fitness values. Now, ultimately, I kind of made up an example here with sort of pre-normalized uh, value like 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.3. But your fitness scores might just be like a whole lot of numbers. Like this one got a fitness of 2,000. This one got a fitness of three. This one got a fitness of 4,228. So what I do is I have a way of saying whatever the fitness numbers might be, take them all and just have them have a range between zero and one. And actually the next thing I do is multiply it by 100. So actually the range is between zero and 100. And you can see that's what's happening right here. I do that mapping, then, oops, ah, ah, I lost my, oh, I, sorry, I lost control of my computer. And then I multiply that value by 100 and that's N. That's how many times 
those elements are in the mating pool itself. So if I were to just do something which I'm a little bit afraid to do, but I'm going to say console log this dot mating pool, and I'm going to go back to the sketch and run it. And what you can see is these are the mating pools, right? And it finished, and you can see that there are uh, this array. This this array is actually quite huge. I wanted to say uh, this dot. I think it might make more sense to say this dot mating pool dot length. So you can see this is how many things are in the mating pool, in the in the 15 to 20,000 range. Whereas the population itself is just 200. But based on their fitness, that mating pool is built much larger. Okay, so. That's, we're getting there. That is, let me go back to this particular algorithm. So that is selection. So once I have the mating pool, then I'm ready for step three, reproduction. All I need to do is I have the mating pool. All the probabilities are already sort of built into that big array right now. I just need to pick two random ones from the array. And we can go into the code itself, and we can see where that happens. Look at this. This for, I want to do this n times. I want to make a new population. Here are all the steps. That's the generate function. Pick two parents. Give me a random index into the mating pool, A. Give me a ra another random index into the mating pool. Now, technically speaking, you might want to say to yourself, ah, do you know what? If B equals A, I want to invalidate B and pick another one. But you know, me, I'm sort of being loosey-goosey about this. It doesn't really matter if I, by accident, on the rare occasion, pick the same parent twice. Big deal. So I have two parents, parent or I play it, partner A and partner B. Both of those are DNA objects that come from the mating pool. And then I simply call crossover. I take partner A, crossover with partner B, and that is a new child element. And then child, I call mutate for the mutation rate. And then I have that new member of the population. So this happens n times. I just say, I have the mating pool. Give me two parents, uh, cross them over, apply mutation. Here's the new child. It goes into the population. This happens over and over again. So I've really looked at every single element of this algorithm here. The last thing, though, is we could look at what has actually happened in crossover mutation. So again, just to remind ourselves, this is the crossover step. The technique that I happen to be applying is take half of one and half of the other and put them together. But certainly, you could take one from each one. I think uh, I don't think I have a diagram for that. Or you could do it a different way. And then mutation, I'm using this probability to say at any given random uh, any, there's a certain chance that I might just change that character randomly. So let's look at how those functions work. Now notice, where is that function happening? I'm saying partner A, that's a DNA object, crossover with partner B, that's another DNA object. So that code for the crossover function itself is in this DNA object, which is right here. So look at this. This is now the crossover function. First of all, I'm creating a new DNA object with the same length the same amount of genes as this current DNA object. I'm picking a random midpoint, right? I could just say, oh, the, ran the midpoint is always 5, or the midpoint is always this.genes.length divided by 2. But I'm picking a random midpoint. And look at this. This child's genes are either coming from, right? If I'm on one side of the midpoint, they come from this particular DNA object's genes. Otherwise, <laughs> um, otherwise, they come from the partner's genes. So this is how I'm applying crossover. It's literally just a new array. Take elements from one array or from the other array. And then mutation, you can see here, mutation, these are incredible, incredibly simple functions. Then I have a new child DNA object. And mutation, these are incredibly simple functions. All it is is, hey, let's look at every single gene and just say, Pick a random number between 0 and 1. If the mutation rate is 0 0.01 or 1%, if I happen to pick a random number less than 0 0.01, then just give me a new character. Forget about whatever I got through crossover. Give me a new character, OK? So this is it. These are all of those pieces. This is the main program, right? In setup, I have what's the target phrase, what's the maximum population, what's the mutation rate. Then I create a new population object. And then I just walk through the algorithm itself. Calculate the fitness, build the mating pool, generate the next population. Evaluate is just checking to see how everything did at the end. That's an, um, and then you know, there's some other code for sort of displaying all the information using DOM elements and that sort of thing. But this is the key algorithm. It's all in separate functions. And each one of these functions, calculate the fitness, natural selection, and generation, simply iterates over that entire population. Right? The population object has 
a population array. I'm always iterating over that population array, calculating the fitness for every element of that array, uh, assigning a probability for every element of that array, picking a random parent from that, for, uh, picking a random element, uh, picking a new child for every element of that array. And all of those functions are in turn in this DNA object. The DNA object stores the actual genetic information. It has a function for calculating the fitness. It has a function for performing crossover. And it has a function for performing mutation. So these are all the elements. So I've kind of finished this here. I'm going to do a follow-up video where I talk about a couple things that I think could optimize or change the way this works. But ultimately, what the, the project for you in your head that you want to think about for right now is, well, what is the thing that you want to make that you might want to try to evolve? Are you trying to evolve a particular design to make it more beautiful or more intuitive? Are you trying to evolve a particular animation behavior of an element on the screen? Um, and what might be, you know, how could this algorithm apply to your scenario? What might be the genetic information? How are you, how is, how is, how is, I just made this like weird, like closing my one eye thing expression at you. I don't know why, <laughs> but um, how, how can how can you apply this sort of algorithm and idea to your particular uh, creative project? And that's what I'm going to start to get to as I look at a few more advanced or more advanced is the wrong word, but really more sophisticated examples of applying this. So I'll see you in the next few videos where I look at some other scenarios and other things with genetic algorithms. Okay, bye bye. Quick addendum here, since I said I would do this. Uh, for those of you that are interested, the code for this example is also available in the processing program environment, which is a, a, a creative coding environment built on top of the Java programming language. So if you're looking for Java classes to do a genetic algorithm, you can find those as well. And really, ultimately, it's all kind of the same. There's some you know, little differences. The, you know, we've got this sort of more classical object-oriented programming where I have a DNA class and a population class. Uh, the population itself is an array, but one thing you'll notice that's kind of key is the mating pool. I'm using as an array list. In JavaScript, arrays can easily just kind of be resized, and things can be added and deleted just with a regular array. But in, in Java itself, uh, uh, an array is a fixed size, which works for the population, which always has a fixed size. But the mating pool itself has to have a flexibly sized array list. But otherwise, everything is essentially the same. And you can see here I have setup where I'm creating a population object and draw where these functions are being called. Natural selection, generate, calculate fitness, um, and various things like displaying the info by drawing text of what's going on on the screen itself. So uh, look for the links in this video's description for also the Java code. And if you have questions about that, please let me know.